Hey to the Dubai debate. So I'm very sorry I can't participate. I'm in Australia and I'm unfortunately a little limited by the time difference. But it sounds incredibly interesting and very, very useful what you're going to be discussing. Both, of course, what is going to happen in the regional issue of what are you going to do after oil and gas, although I wouldn't worry too much because that is pretty far off, but also that you're going to be talking about nuclear and you're going to talk, talk about energy in general and, of course, uh, renewable energy. My pitch on this issue, and that's going to be my two cents worth in your conversation, is really that we need to recognize that the current approach that we're following just doesn't work. We're so focused on getting a few solar panels up on our rooftops that it makes us feel good, but because they're still vastly more expensive, they are not actually going to solve anything. They're just simply going to be niche products that make Western governments and other feel-good governments feel good, but it's not actually going to cut into the real emissions of CO2. So what we need to do instead of focusing on subsidizing inefficient technologies like solar panels, and that has been the policy over the last 20 years and it has failed as such, what we need to do is instead focus on dramatically ramping up investment into research and development in making those technologies much cheaper. Imagine if we over the next 20 to 40 years could make renewables, could make solar panels cheaper than fossil fuels. We would have solved the problem. Everyone would move, also the Chinese and the Indians and everyone else. Not because they were green, not because they were forced to, but simply because those technologies were cheaper. So the solution is, yes, go on with what we're doing right now, which unfortunately means using a lot of fossil fuels because they power everything we like, but dramatically ramp up investment in research and development into green energy technologies so that over the next 20 to 40 years, we will be able to make an energy transition. It's much cheaper than what we're proposing today. It's much more likely to lead to an energy revolution. And ultimately, of course, it's much more likely that if the economics is right, that we will actually transition to a post-fossil fuel economy. Those are my two cents. I wish you all the best in Dubai with your debates and best of luck here from Australia. Take care, bye. I suppose that to, where I disagree with what Bjorn Lomborg said there was that uh, he, he dismissed solar power, for example, as you know, uh, uh, people putting a few solar panels on their rooftops and uh, it's uh, a feel-good thing rather than, than anything substantial. But of course, this is one region of the world where indeed it can be something a hell of a lot more substantial. The sun, the space, and all the rest of it. Clearly, there are challenges such as, for example, that um, the, uh, the sun shines at slightly the wrong time for when the grid needs energy, i.e. in the evening. Um, but you know, there, there clearly are opportunities here that, that could be exploited with a bit of imagination. And uh, I was very interested, uh, just by way of example of, of some of the things that are already going on, uh, a couple of weeks ago, or even last week, um, Alex Salmond, the First Minister of Scotland, was, uh, was in town and uh, uh, doing quite a sort of heavy pitch to the Emirati authorities about um, renewable energy. And his pitch very simply was, look, you've got a lot of sun here. Solar can be a big game for you. Uh, We've got a lot of wind in Scotland. Um, wind and wave power can be big for us. We've also got technical expertise. Why don't you've got capital? Why don't we work together? Uh, and we can take advantage of your capital, our joint expertise. You know, Scottish universities with excellent research facilities and, and all the rest of it, um, and, uh, and develop new techniques and renewables which are transferable across um, different different industries. Um, now. You know, he's a politician, of course, he knows how to make a compelling pitch, but uh, it sounded a very interesting idea, and obviously uh, at a very, very early stage. But it's an idea, it's a sen it gives a sense, I suppose, of how you know, people on uh, both uh, in the Gulf and outside are um, thinking about these, uh, um, these things right now and moving beyond um, the fossil fuels. Okay, what do you I think we're seeing a change. I mean, I don't, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't have an oil-based economy 
use so long as it is um, developed in a sustainable way. Because at the end of the day, this is what we have. You know, you have 60% uh, of the world's oil reserves are in this part of the world. And you see divergences, you know, the politics of different countries that are, are different. Apart from Libya, which is a major oil producer, the rest of the Gulf, we haven't seen any trouble. So obviously something is being done right. Uh, I think we're seeing more concern now for preserving for future generations the resources that we have, as the Saudis have done, as I think the UAE is doing. Uh, it's a sort of bit of a, 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 a paradox because you can do that, but at the same time it means you're not investing in the future. Uh, in future capacity, which might down the road mean that oil prices spike, but that's that's another story we can we can go back to. Uh, Saudi Arabia has been throwing money at um, potential trouble. We're told, you know, more spending, but again, not a bad thing. We're seeing more social spending. We're seeing uh, a diversified economy that is that is maybe oil and gas based, but we're seeing um, petrochemicals industry uh, growing in this part of the world. We're seeing more downstream. We're seeing more job creation. Um, as a result of this expanding, well, we're seeing it all across, I think. We're seeing it in, in the region because you're going from, you know, you're not Some just looking at us. I that and say that it just re-emphasizes the rentier state welfare model and that the government is the uh, uh, employer of last resort, if you may. No, management, no. But what I think is you are seeing in places like Iraq, you've got a lot of private sector investment now because you've got a, a lot of foreign oil companies going in. So that's creating a totally different dynamic on the ground. And I think you use the strengths that you have. And at the moment, this is what we can use in order to make life better for our people. A scale of 1 to 10, how satisfied are you with the efforts of the GCC country to diversify their economies? 10 well, being... <laughs> Five. In a positive way. Five. 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 Thank you. Somewhere in between. Thank you. Robin. I think the answer to the question that was posed, you know, what's, what's after oil and gas for the Gulf is a lot more oil and gas, certainly over the next several decades to come. So what do you like, eight? Uh, well, hang on, don't get me on diversification here. Yeah? That's a whole <laughs> other thing. But, you know, the, there's often this question about what is the post-oil economy in the Gulf, and... Uh, I, for me, it's a bit premature to be asking that question. I say, you know, the, the last drop of oil in the, in the world will come out of the ground in Saudi Arabia. 